Here are people who have given their talents to STEM and who represent a minority in their areas. We ask them about their inspiration and contributions, the obstacles that may have led them to leaving STEM, and how these were overcome. As you listen, consider the consequences of diverse talent gain or loss from STEM. I think probably when I really decided I wanted to be a researcher was when I was at medical school. And I spent a lot of time the first few years of medical school asking a lot of questions. And then I saw a lecture from, a lecture from someone who was an epidemiologist. And I realised that that was really in some ways the theory of mind for medicine. It was really what defined what worked and what didn't. And I thought, aha, that's exactly what I want to do. The thing that I get most excited about is trying to understand very broadly how things work. Always that's the question. You know, you see something interesting, how does that work? And I think how living things work is particularly extraordinary and I've always found that an attractive and exciting thing to think about. So I, I've, it, it was never really a, a, a difficult thing for me. I just kind of followed my nose into science. It was when I had this extraordinary physics teacher and I suddenly could see how physics was really the language that allowed us to connect all the concepts that underpin our universe together. And that in a way you didn't need to remember lots of complicated facts, but you could figure one thing out from another with the aid of maths using the concepts of physics. Really, mathematics is where my passion was because it allowed me to explore where truth was, where um, the answers to these questions about the universe might be in a very deep way. And so that's why I decided to pursue a career in mathematics. Well, the time that I did seriously consider leaving science is when I had a family. I had young children. I have three children who are now all in their 20s, but when they were very young, it was really, really difficult to keep up a science career and a family. And at that stage, I did consider other options. Uh, the biggest obstacle, I think, was being able to keep up the level of productivity that you needed in order to be competitive in the grant system. Uh, in order to keep your science and your activity going while at the same time uh, spending time with your young children. Probably the biggest obstacle is, was later in my career when I was in a leadership position and I was having huge difficulties um, with uh, some of the people that I was working for. Um, and I really felt that my leadership wasn't valued. I felt that I was actually being discriminated against because I, I was a woman. Um, and I really considered at that point whether I wanted to keep on going. As I neared the end of my undergraduate years, um, having had a lot of fun doing my first really big research project in my honours year, I thought I may well continue in that topic area in photonics for my PhD, but I wanted to keep um, it open. So I went around looking for some other prospective PhD projects at other universities in areas I thought were interesting. And it took a bit of courage to do that rather than stay with what I knew. I looked up a professor who was doing some really intriguing work at a, another university and made an appointment to go and see him to see whether or not he might be interested in taking me on as a PhD student. I turned up with my CV and my publication list and my grades and he said to me in a very kind and gentle manner that he was glad that I was interested but he didn't think I was the calibre of student he was looking for. And it wasn't till the conversation had ended and I was out there quite shaken up that I realised he actually hadn't looked at my grades. And I'd had high distinctions in all my physics and maths subjects which should have prepared me quite well for the PhD that he could have given me. I went to my first international conference and gave a poster. Um, and as I stood next to my poster during the time that they allocate to it, um, a famous professor from a US university came along and pulled up a trestle to put right next to me and posted up his most recent paper on it. And he stood there and as people came by, he would yell out very loudly, come and look at my poster, don't look at hers. Mine's much better than hers. That was an example of a very visible and extreme level of competition that happens in science. And it's actually there constantly, even if it's not as visible as that particular incident was. When I made that decision, or thought I'd made that decision to leave, uh, it was actually quite devastating. I felt that 
dreams were being taken away from me and uh, it was actually quite a depressing moment in my, in my academic career. So I chose to stay, to fight for my position as a scientist because that's what will make me happy and that's what I want to wake up every day and keep on doing. Well, the first thing I did was really to, to reconnect myself with why I was a scientist and why I did it. And that was really forced, first and foremost about answering really big questions and about data. So I actually um, kind of withdrew myself from the sort of conflicts that can often happen with politics and those kind of things and really focused on why I was doing it and focused on answering those questions. So that was the main thing. I also surrounded myself with people who are incredibly talented. I've got an absolutely brilliant team and I also found that through networks and through my organisation and through other organisations it was actually a lot of support. I also actually did get professional help as well which, uh, which was incredibly helpful. I think the really key thing for me was having a mentor. Uh, not everyone has that and so I was very fortunate in having that mentor. Um, that person actually has served uh, me very well over the, over the course of my career. Um, she went on to become a supervisor for my PhD as well and largely it's her capacity to be able to communicate what's critical in scientific method and particularly around statistics that helped me really understand what the issues were and helped to break it down so I could solve the problem myself. A key aspect of um, overcoming that obstacle was to have a supportive uh, boss uh, and also to have a supportive husband in my case. Both of those were really important. In any job there are things that give you enormous energy um, and there are things that are very draining and I've learnt to be very conscious of what that balance is for me. What I do is I check the evidence just like you know when I'm doing science or mathematics. So in that example of the poster session where there was a famous professor standing next to me, um, the first, the, the natural question that came out of that was, you know, is my work good enough? If he's saying it's not good enough and his is better, is mine good enough? And so I had to think that through. And the evidence was that a famous professor is trying to compete with me a little measly graduate student. So therefore, my work must have been good enough. So I had to develop these ways of thinking to work out whether I should keep going. And it's actually a very good habit of mine to develop, to be able to check the evidence and bring it out uh, in order to um, show that your work is actually better than it's been judged to be. I'm mostly proud of my PhD research, which allowed me to discover a molecule, which is a secondary metabolite in plants. It's called galantamine, and it's used now as a drug to slow down the Alzheimer disease from progressing in patients. That was a great impact because it used to be synthesized chemically and it used to be expensive. Now it can be extracted from the plants and it's more accessible for the patients with Alzheimer's disease. I'm really proud of the work that I've done on hormonal therapy for the menopause in identifying its links with breast cancer. I'm also really, really proud of the work that we've done with WHO looking at the relationship of female genital mutilation to obstetric outcome and providing the primary evidence that drives advocacy in that area, as well as being really important foundational information for the UN resolution against female genital mutilation. You know, plants are extraordinary. They're really extraordinary. They're more or less building themselves out of thin air and I would very much like to understand how that works, how they manage to do that. And I, I yeah, the work we've done um, in my group over the years has, has certainly um, contributed to that, but um, I, I'm so kind of captivated, I suppose, by the extraordinary things that plants do. I don't really think of it as I'm proud of myself for trying to understand that. I think of it more as, as um, it's just amazing what plants do and, and I'm very excited to be able to, to spend my life trying to, to work on that. 
I'm proud of several things in my field. One, the contribution I made to understanding how genes respond to signals in the immune system. The second thing that I'm proud of is the number of people who came through my lab and I trained in science, either as PhDs or postdocs, and uh, were able to then contribute as they developed their careers. And the third thing is leadership in science. I think it's very important for women to have a leadership role in science so that then they, they create an example for other people coming through. So what I'm most proudest of is that I ask questions that nobody else seems to have even thought of asking and that I am capable of answering them. I wish in the future we have more funding to do more research, to be able to discover more talents for, in science and more people that are interested in science but they might be lost because of the lack of funding. The number of men in nursing still is restricted to between 9 and 10 percent. Um, I think it's finally breaking past that 10 percent, but um, we, we still struggle to try and get the message across that um, nursing is for everyone, not just a single gender. Science absolutely requires diversity. The whole point is you're trying to come up with new ideas, new ways of thinking about things. And that works much better if you have many different sorts of people contributing from many different backgrounds with many different skill sets. And so creating research environments where um, diversity is welcome, that are truly inclusive and truly focused on the, on the science, I think is really key to the success of the whole scientific enterprise. My one wish for the future is that your ability to do science and engage in whether it's research or application of science has nothing to do with your personality attributes and your background.